We are going to continue. This is part four of Watch Your Words. And we're going to we're going to start with reading chapter two from this little book from Kenneth Hagin called Words. And chapter two is about how your words affect your children. And I'll just say that it's not just your children, but anyone, uh, anyone you're speaking about. Okay, so this is Kenneth Hagin Sr. is telling the story, and he's going to start by talking about his son, Kenneth Hagin Jr. Kenneth Hagin Sr. is, he's passed away. Um, Kenneth Hagin Jr., he's still alive. Okay, so when Ken Jr. was two and a half years old, I held that little fellow up in my hands, and I said, Lord, thank you for this boy. I realize that you've given this new life that I hold in my hands to my wife and me. I realize that it's my responsibility because I know the Bible to train up this child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I realize that your word says to bring children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because children are trained not only by precept, but also by example. I'm going to live right in front of him. I'm going to do what's right. And I'll be honest with you if I miss it. When our little girl Pat was born, I took her into my hands immediately. And I said the same thing I had said over Ken. I will do right. I will raise her right. I will train her. I will set the right example in front of her and teach her precepts from the word of God. I will also teach her by example. I know you can have what you say. So I say that this child, like Ken, will grow up strong physically, without sickness or disease, will be alert mentally and stalwart spiritually. Years afterwards, even our kinfolk, who felt we had ruined everything by going off with tongue talkers, said there is something to that. There has to be. Kenneth's children are never sick. I never prayed in my life that either of my children would be saved. Not one single prayer. I never prayed a prayer that either one of them would be filled with the Spirit. They're adults now with families of their own, and I don't believe I prayed more than half a dozen times for both of them in all these years. Why? Because you can have what you say, and I had already said it. If I were to pray about it now, it would mean that I didn't mean it then. They got saved and filled with the Spirit at an early age. Sometimes I had to go to them when they were little and say, Forgive me, Daddy acted ugly if I lost my temper. I had to say, I've set the wrong example. I've asked the Lord to forgive me, and He's forgiven me. Will you forgive me? And those little children would say, All right. I never told my children not to do something just because I tell you not to. I sat down and read the Bible to them proving to them that I had their interests at heart. If I had to reprimand them or even spank them, I said, it says right here in Ephesians 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and you may live long on the earth. I explained to them that Days a person is sick or in the hospital are not well days. I said, see, I want I want it to be well with you. I want you to enjoy long years on the earth. Children are a product of words. Words heal us or make us sick. Words bless us or curse us. The words that I hear in the morning will linger with me all through the day. How little wives or husbands may realize that a biting, stinging word in the morning will rob a husband or wife of efficiency the whole day long. But a loving, tender, beautiful word, a little prayer word, will fill him or her with music and will lead them into victory. Learn to make words work for you. Learn to fill words with power that cannot be resisted. The way you fill words with power that cannot be resisted is to fill words with love and faith. Parents need to realize that the home atmosphere is a product of words. In 1958, as my wife and I were driving near Los Angeles, she suggested, why don't we stop and see brother and sister so-and-so? We had held them a revival several months before, 
and their house was only about three blocks off the freeway. All right, I said, we'll drive by. We pulled up in the driveway, but we didn't see any activity. I rang the doorbell. I heard someone coming. The pastor opened the door, shook hands with me, and I motioned for my wife to come inside. The pastor said, Brother Hagen, we were resting. My wife will have to dress. Just sit here in the living room. He had on his robe, so he went off to dress too. My wife came inside. She didn't see or speak to him. The moment we sat on the couch, we turned to one another and said at the same time, sharp words were spoken in this home. The atmosphere was bad. We both sensed it immediately. Spiritual things are created by words. Spiritual things are created by words. Even natural physical things are created by words. Even natural physical things are created by words. If you went into a room where they had just been frying fish, you would smell the fish. It would still be in the atmosphere. The air was heavy in that room. Those words were still in the air. There are words in the air around you right now. If you don't believe it, turn on a radio. As we talked to this pastor and his wife, we learned that they had indeed had a disagreement. The lives and personalities of children brought up in that kind of an atmosphere will be warped. Mothers and dads, your home atmosphere is the product of words. Children fail because wrong words were spoken. The right words were not spoken. Why is it that some families grow up strong and win life's fight? It is because the right kind of words were spoken in that home. My wife and I were visiting in New Mexico once on our day off. We drove more than 100 miles to see friends who had just built a beautiful new church. As they were showing us the new building, the pastor's wife was chatting with my wife and she said, You know, we can't do a thing in the world with our oldest boy. He's almost 17. He won't come to church. He wants to join the Navy, and when he gets 17, we're going to sign for him and let him go just to get rid of him. I guess you know what I'm talking about, though. You've got a teenage boy. My wife replied, no, I cannot understand. You'd have to knock my boy in the head to keep him out of church, even when he should probably stay home to study. Why? Because he had been trained that way. The right kind of words were spoken in the home. Words make a boy love an education. Words bring a boy to church or keep him away. We are a product of words. You can go to church on Sunday, sit there and look pious if you want to, pray and sing in the choir, and even teach Sunday school. But if you fly off the handle at home, cuss, raise the devil, and fuss, you're going to lose your children. They are not being brought up in a church atmosphere. They are brought up in a home atmosphere. And that church atmosphere on Sunday is going to affect them very little. One Sunday morning during the summer of 1943, I was preaching at a church in north central Texas. My text was Colossians 2, 9, 10, where it says, You are complete in him. And my title was, What is Spirituality? I have never been brave enough to use that text again. I asked the question, Where would you go to look for a spiritual person? Some thought of people in our church who were quick to jump, quick to dance, quick to shout, and they said they're spiritual. I told the congregation, that's not spirituality. You can't judge spirituality by that. Somebody else said, so-and-so is always talking in tongues and is always giving messages in tongues, so he's really spiritual. I said, no, no, you can't judge spirituality by that because God will use any kind of vessel he can. I read where he talked through a donkey one time. That doesn't mean that the donkey was spiritual. No, I said, I know that spiritual people do go to church, but I wouldn't even go to church if I were looking for a spiritual person. You know the first place I'd go? They all said no. I said I'd go to a person's home. You see, when it comes to religious things, people are two-faced. They've got one face that they wear on Sunday and another face they wear another day. I've seen them as a pastor. I've knocked on their doors and heard them whisper, put that up, put that up, put that up. There was something they didn't want me to see. And you never heard such scurrying around. I thought they were never going to open the door. No, I told the congregation. 
I'd just like to become the invisible man, walk through the door, look and listen. And I said, people who are spiritual, people who have people who have really got something, live right at home. And if you don't live right at home, you haven't got anything. A lady in the second pew said, oh my God, that lets me out. She later said she thought she had just thought it. She didn't realize she had said it out loud. It ruined my sermon. Everybody burst out laughing. I fell over the pulpit laughing. I stopped right there, and I've never tried that sermon again. All right, so um, let's talk about that. So some really good things were said here. So first of all, we know that we can have whatever we say. So any words that we speak that are filled with faith, we will have those words. You know, whether they're whether they're good and godly words aligned with the will of God, or whether they're words aligned with the will of the devil, whatever words we're speaking and believing, we're going to receive those things. Amen. So we can have the things we say. Therefore, speak good things over every aspect of your life. Speak good things over your spouse. Speak good things over your children, over your finances, over your job, over your school. Whatever it is that you're in your ministry, whatever it is you're involved in, speak good things over it. Okay, so the challenge here is there could be things in your life that are frustrating. Maybe your spouse is driving you crazy. Maybe your children are driving you crazy. Maybe your job is driving you crazy. And so whenever we have these frustrations in life, it's tempting and very normal for people to condemn these things, to speak harshly to their wife or speak harshly to their children or to maybe maybe we say really bad things. You know, man, my child is so dumb. They won't they won't ever study. They're not interested in school. You know, so you may be declaring the situation as it is in the moment. But if you're if you're saying if, if you continue to declare the present situation as it is, it's not going to change. You have to speak things into existence. We have to speak words of faith to call into existence the things that we want, the good things that we want. You know, so if your spouse is being a pain and you keep telling everybody, my spouse is a pain, my spouse is a pain, she's never going to change, she's a pain, then, well, we're going to retain that. You know, the situation will stay the same or get worse, but it will not get better as long as we're speaking like that. If your job is frustrating you and you keep speaking bad about your job, you're going to maintain it as bad or you're going to worsen it, right? And so instead of speaking like the world and condemning the things that are frustrating in our lives, we need to speak words of faith. You know, we need to speak the will of God over over every aspect of our life and especially the frustrating situations and the frustrating people, right? And that way we can bring forth a better outcome. And, you know, Kyber, she is full of amazing examples of declaring good things over her children. And like literally her son would have words that she had declared would come out of his mouth, like the same exact words. You know, it's just phenomenal. So you can see like Kenneth and his wife, they had a great experience praying for their children. And in fact, not praying, but declaring good things over them when they were born. And, and this is really important because we're so wrapped up in prayer like we've just generally speaking, we seem to think we have to pray for each and every little thing that happens in life. And I think we, we need to pray less and we need to expect more, right? We need to pray less and we need to expect more and we should be declaring things. If you think back in the Old Testament, you know, the, a father figure would speak blessings. You know, he would bless his children, you know, bless this one, bless this one. For some reason, they would curse some children. They would speak bad things over this child good things over that one. And they did that once, you know, like when they were little kids and those things would come true. The good things they spoke would come true. The bad things they spoke would come true. So the difference is that that culture back in that day, they really believed in the power of their words and they were, they truly believed when they blessed, it would come to pass and they didn't have to keep reiterating it. They didn't have to keep praying about it. They spoke it once. They spoke it in belief. And then it came, it came to pass in due time. And that's exactly what Kenneth Hagin and his wife did. They spoke over their little children. You know, the boy was two and a half hours old. The daughter, you know, as soon as, as soon as she was born, she was also spoken over. So they just blessed them. And look what it did for them. I don't believe I have prayed more than half a dozen times for them in all these years. Because they, they declared good things over their children when they were tiny 
And those things came to pass. So prayer wasn't required because problems like sickness just were not arising because they declared in the beginning they would not be sick. Amen. So we want we want to like arise in believing in that kind of power of our words. And then we're going to be praying for less things like we truly it should be that our prayer is more outwardly focused than focused on our own household because it could it should be that we know the goodwill of God so well and we declare it you know we we have a confession of scripture we confess good things of ourselves and those things should just naturally be coming true and there shouldn't be a whole lot for us to pray about for our own lives we should just be expecting the will of God to be done and just watching it happen and it should be that more of our prayer should be directed outward to help other people. And if you think about Jesus, uh, I don't think he ever prayed for himself. I mean, maybe when he was asking God, you know, is there any other way than me having to go through it with all this torture and death? I really don't want to do this. I don't want to be tortured. I don't want to be put to shame. I don't want to be killed. You know, is there any other way? But that's the only prayer that I'm aware of that he prayed for himself. All the other prayers were about other things like picking disciples or healing people or bringing forth um, supernatural provision to provide for the people or raising the dead or casting on demons. So he, his prayer life was outwardly focused. You know, his needs were just naturally being fulfilled because he knew he was a son of God and his father would take care of him. Amen. So let us arise in expectation faith. Let us arise in confession of good things over our life. And let us see a lessening of prayer for ourselves and just expecting more and watching it come to pass. Okay, number two, if you confess or declare good things over your household and your life, there will be fewer problems in life that require prayer to overcome an issue. So we just talked about that. You know, so your children, just speak health over them. You know, your loved ones, speak health over them. Um, just like Kenneth and his wife did. Number three, Speaking the right words over yourself, your children, your spouse, or any other thing can produce a life of health, of faith, and victory. And the opposite is true. Speaking negative words over yourself, negative words over your children, negative words over your health, over your job, over your projects, over your ministry, over whatever, negative words will bring forth failure, death, destruction, sickness, and defeat. So we have to be extremely careful with our words. And we should speak in a manner that we don't want to say anything that we don't want to come true because we should believe that every word we speak will come true. We should believe that every word we speak will come true and therefore we should, we should pause before we speak. We, we, should, we should like put a little delay factor in, especially in frustrating situations, pause and think about God's will and then speak it rather than speaking emotionally in a time of frustration. And for me, that's something I need to work on in my house because I can get frustrated and then I could just pop off emotionally rather than pausing. And I'm getting better at that, but I still have a lot of improvement to do. So I need to get better, not responding emotionally, not responding rashly, but taking a moment to think about God's will and making sure I speak that and not something that's contrary to it. Okay, number four. When correcting someone, it is good to prove to them why you have a certain perspective by showing them from the Bible. Okay, so when you show somebody from the Bible, you're showing them you know, what God has said. So then your argument is based on God's authority and God's wisdom and they will therefore either accept God or reject what God says about that subject. And so the example from Kenneth and his wife, let's see, somewhere he was saying, um, where'd it go? Yeah, like if he had to reprimand his children, he would refer to scripture so that they knew the biblical principle behind whatever he was doing. You know, so it wasn't, he was just saying, I told you not to. You know, he, he avoided that. And instead, if he wanted to give, um, wisdom or correction to his children, he showed them from the Bible. And so that's a good habit. That way people will see that it's not just me trying to impose my will upon you, but it's what God says. You know, And we can think about there's societal issues right now, like there's a promotion of perversion. There's a promotion of, of homosexuality, for example. There's a, a promotion of 
you know, changing your gender. You know, there all these weird, perverse things are being pushed, and people say may say that we're being um, condemning or unaccepting or, or whatever, um, coming against people by 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 saying that that's ungodly. But we need to show them from Scripture that that is a perversion. It's not the will of God, right? So you can leverage this in you know at home. You can leverage this in cultural issues to help make your point, things like that. I would say that we also, when correcting somebody and showing from the Bible, we need to make sure that we don't Bible thump them and give them a sermon unless, you know, unless they ask for more information. Okay. And then number five, people, especially children are a product of the words we speak, speak excellent words over people. Therefore, and remember the Old Testament blessings that the patriarchs would make over their children, and they would come true. You know, maybe some things would come true quickly, some things would come true later in life, but they would speak one time, and those blessings, they would come true. And even the curses that they spoke would come true. So we don't want to speak any curses. We want to speak blessing only. You know, uh, And the Holy Spirit tells us in the book of James that blessing and cursing should not come out of the same mouth. Only blessings should come out of our mouth. All right, number six, words activate spiritual things. If you are speaking harsh, angry, hateful, demeaning, or negative words, you will literally raise the devil. You will activate demons, you know, because you're speaking forth the will of the devil. You're speaking in a manner that's aligned with the devil if you're speaking this way. So we can raise the devil or we can raise the Holy Spirit. Or you can speak words of love aligned with the spirit of love to manifest God's presence. Yeah, so Jesus said when two or more are gathered in his name. So are we speaking words of God, in which case he will be present with us? Or are we speaking words of the devil, in which case the devil will happily make company with us? So we don't want to, to have the devil's company. We want the Holy Spirit. Okay, number seven. Our words have the power to influence physical things. Okay, so if we speak the right words, then we can bring forth good physical things. So, for example, we can declare that we walk in health. We can declare that we're healed and whole. Um, we can speak words of healing. So we, we literally can just walk in health. We literally can manifest physical healing just by speaking words. And Jesus did it all the time. We do it all the time. It's not limited to healing. You can speak words and you can bring forth supernatural provision. You know, Jesus told Peter to go fishing and he caught tax money in the fish's mouth. Um, he told them to take the boat out and drop the net and they caught the fish. You know, so we can literally, you know, he, he blessed the food and the food multiplied and they were kept breaking and breaking and breaking the, the bread and the fish and it just kept multiplying and kept multiplying. Okay, so... We can bring forth physical things with the words we speak, provision, healing, protection, you know, different things like that. Okay, so our homework based on words chapter two is this. Let's evaluate ourselves to identify where our words and actions are ungodly and make course corrections. So maybe there are particular frustrating situations or frustrating people Maybe your spouse is frustrating you or your kids are or your job. You know, there, there may be certain things in our lives that we're speaking negatively about and we need to purpose ourselves to start speaking life and victory and the will of God and blessing over those people and over those situations. Amen. So your words, whether positive or negative, will shape your future. So our words, positive or negative, will shape our future. So uh, point number one, our words, the words we spoke yesterday made life what it is today. So that's a quote from chapter one. Our words, the words we spoke yesterday made life what it is today. So if we want a better tomorrow, then we need to start speaking better things today so that our future days will, will be good. Amen. So we'll speak good things. We're going to increase dramatically, all of us. We're going to increase dramatically in declaring and speaking good things. We're going to increase dramatically in receiving good things. We're going to grow continuously in speaking life and health and victory and blessing. And we will walk in it as well. Amen. 
Proverbs 18, 20 to 21. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So when your mom said, you're going to eat those words, it really is true. Okay, the Bible tells us it's true. And, and it says that our tongue has the power to produce death, and our tongue has the power to produce life. So faith works in, in two directions. It works in the direction of God. It works in the direction of the devil. So every time we speak words, our words are containers of power. Like All the words we speak, they contain power. They contain the power of God, the power of life, the power of victory, the power of health, the power of blessing, the power of victory. Or our words are containers of the devil's power, of steal, of kill, of destroy, of sickness, defeat, of curse. So every single word that we spit out of our mouth, it's a container of either God's power or a container of Satan's power. And so we want to make sure that we're only speaking forth God's power. Amen? And, and it's, it's literal and it's true. Death and life are in the words we speak. So we need to make sure that we only speak words of life. And, and I've done experimentation on this. And um, I'll just replay an example. And you've heard it before, but I'll say it again. So my mother-in-law, she, um, she had had a stroke. She was living in a nursing home. And, and, and um, she used to be pretty heavy. And then she lost a lot of weight. And then she started eating these stupid little orange crackers with the peanut butter in the middle. You know what I'm talking? They come in a plastic pack. There's six crackers, the little square things. And she would just sit there. She's stuck in a nursing home, stuck in bed. She had nothing to do. And so she's just eating these stupid orange crackers. And I hated those orange crackers because she, she started getting big again from stupid little orange crackers. I hated those things. And I had just listened to Andrew Womack's teaching um, called The Power of Faith-Filled Words. And I'm like, I have a good idea. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to curse those stupid orange crackers so that if she eats them, she'll get sick in her stomach so that she'll quit eating them. Okay, so my hard intention was I wanted her to stop eating those stupid crackers because she was just like, you know, blowing up. And she had just lost all that weight. You know, I didn't want her to gain it back from these worthless crackers. I hated them. And so, uh, so anyway, so I did it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I curse these stupid orange crackers. I curse you. Whoever eats you shall get sick in their stomach. And so be it in the name of Jesus. So that's, that's just about exactly what I said. And the next day, my wife called me up and she's like, hey, Bobby, um, I just got a call from the nursing home and they said they had to clean my mom up. And I'm like, well, what happened? And they said, well, she threw up on herself. I'm like, well, why did she throw up? I totally forgot. I cursed the crackers the day before. And she said, well, the nurse said she was eating those orange crackers and she threw up all over herself. And I was like, oh, I did that. You know, I was responsible for that. Well, what was Jesus doing? Acts 10.38 says that Jesus, um, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. So when somebody has a healing need, such as they're sick in their stomach and they're vomiting, um, who has oppressed them? The devil did, Right. Anybody who has a healing need, they are oppressed by the devil. Sickness is oppression of the devil. You know, injury is oppression of the devil. Car crash is oppression of the devil. Vomiting from eating orange crackers is oppression of the devil. So when I cursed those crackers, I literally brought forth Satan's power of sickness and it came true. And I felt really bad about what I did. You know, I, you know, my heart intention was good. I wanted her to stop eating the crackers, but my mechanism was evil. You know, I should pray for her heart or pray against, you know, um, overeating or something like that. I should not have cursed the crackers to bring forth sickness. So literally think about that. Think about like when a relative hears uh, a doctor report that, you know, your loved one has such and such diagnosis and they're going to die. And then somebody believes that and they start Reproclaiming that and reproclaiming that and reproclaiming that. What are they doing? They're speaking words of death and they're speaking faith filled 
words of death because they really believe that what the doctor said is true and they keep speaking their faith. Oh, so-and-so is going to die. You know, and, and guess what? It comes true. You know, so there is a lot of power in our words and we need to wake up to that. So we need to use our words extremely carefully, only speaking life. And we should pray for self-control of the Holy Spirit to do that. In fact, let's just do that right now. All right, so Jesus and Father and Holy Spirit, we love you. And we thank you for this teaching on words. We thank you for this repeat teaching on words because we, we need to grow in this quickly. So we ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will prune each and every one of us. Prune us from speaking death. Prune us from declaring bad things. Prune us from careless speech. We just ask that you strengthen us and self-control over our the, over the words we speak. Well, first of all, we ask that you strengthen us in believing the right things, in speaking the right things. We ask that you will put a, a pause inside of us so that we will pause before we speak, especially before, you know, especially inside of frustrating situations. We ask that you will just have us to pause rather than blurting out negative, death-filled, failure-bringing kinds of things. We ask that you will have us to pause and that Holy Spirit, you will remind us of good things the goodwill of God, that we will adjust ourselves, align our words to the will of God, and that we will speak it forth so that we avoid speaking words of death, but so that we prosper in speaking words of life. And we ask that you make this our first nature, that even in the frustrations of life, we speak forth life as just a natural response, never speaking curse, never speaking death, never speaking in agreement with the devil, and so be it for each of us listening to this right now. So be it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Bobby, this is Mitch. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure I sent you a copy of this article or not, but they had an article in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago uh, reviewing a book that had to do with uh, uh, aging. And, what they, and they cited these studies that were just... Uh, flabbergasting really is that uh, based on the actual government statistics um, the people that had a positive view on aging that didn't think bad things were going to happen to them and, and I have to believe spoke positively compared to those that had negative lived 7.2 years longer on average that's 10% more longer life uh, and they talk positive attitude but i think we can also say it would have been positive uh confessions too and speaking positive things uh, about that you know so rather than confessing that you know you're gonna go blind deaf and crippled you know you say i'm gonna be healthy and vigorous and walk down the mountain when i'm 120 like moses so anyway so that's that's uh some uh i guess secular verification of the whole principle that you can have what you, you say. And that and that's an important point also is that this principle doesn't apply only to people who believe in God. This principle applies to everybody, you know, and unfortunately only a few people know that their words really have this kind of power. And, and that study is just, like you said, it's a secular verification of the scripture. That's good. All right. Um, Proverbs 6.2 says, you are snared, you are trapped by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So our mouth can become a trap for us if we declare bad things. You know, there are people that speak forth, you know, failure, that speak forth sickness. That There's people that declare that, you know, my great-grandmother had breast cancer, my mom had breast cancer, my sister had breast cancer, I'm going to have it too. I, you've just sealed the deal, you know? So we need to be careful not to be snared by our words by speaking forth the will of the devil. And especially, like, there are some, there are some challenging situations in life. Like when somebody has a family tree with a lineage of cancer or some particular disease or problem or addiction or something like that, it can really seem that that family line is cursed and people can easily believe that and they can easily expect that's going to happen to them. But... We need to realize that Jesus bore the curse for us. Jesus has redeemed us from curse. So let that cycle be broken with you. Amen? Let the cycle be broken with you by choosing to believe that Jesus has freed you from curse. 
By choosing to believe in the goodwill of God, therefore you are exempt from the evil. Amen? So let us not be trapped by the words we speak. And the way to do that is to speak words that are in agreement with the will of God and the will of God only. Okay, now James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. <laughs> okay, so the book of James is generally um, written to newer believers, and so he's trying to like instill some correct behaviors inside of them. And so he's warning them about the tongue. The Holy Spirit is warning the people through James about the tongue. Because, you know, in the world around you, people are very dangerous with their tongues. They speak bad things. They speak negative things. They agree with bad doctor reports, you know, whatever. There's just a lot of neg negativity in the speech that most common people have. And that will defile your body. And so it's people like you'll hear people like bragging about their sickness or declaring they're going to get sick or, you know, it's flu season. I'm, I'm going to get the flu just like I do every year or every year I get bronchitis. You know, there are people that will say things like that and they don't even think about it. And what are they doing? They're speaking the will of the devil over their life, proclaiming sickness via their tongue. And what happens? Their body's defiled with, with sickness, right? They literally get sick. Because their, their tongue is in agreement with the devil's will of sickness, of steal, of kill, of destroy, of curse. Okay? And he says, you know, our tongue can set the course of our life on fire. So if we're speaking in agreement with the devil, our life is going to be ablaze in a bad way. And, and so we need to be careful that we're only speaking in agreement with God. Okay, number five. Your beliefs... And your tongue, your speech, control your destiny. Your beliefs, your tongue, and your speech control your destiny. Do you want good things in life? You must speak good things. If you don't want negative things in life, don't speak them into being. Change your beliefs by feeding on godly, faith-building things. And change your words to be words of life and victory aligned to God's will. Okay, what things in life are you speaking negatively about? Okay, and here's some things just to get your, your thoughts flowing. So are there certain people that you're speaking negatively about? Are you speaking neg negatively about your spouse, about children, about friends, coworkers, neighbors, even evil people? Are you speaking, are you speaking the will of the devil over evil people? And you know, we should be speaking the will of God over evil people even the evil people. Even though that's challenging, we have to overcome that challenge and we have to do that. Okay, what about provision? Are you speaking victory or defeat in your finances? Are you speaking victory over bills? Are you speaking that you're going to get laid off from your job or that you're going to grow and prosper in your job? Um, what are you saying about taxes, about bonuses, about raises? So it's easy to get caught in a loop, like maybe your company hasn't offered a raise in a while. And then, you know, you might get frustrated and say, you know, we're, we're probably not going to get a raise this year either. Well, you're speaking faith in a negative direction, so you're going to receive according to your faith. So we need to speak amazing things. We need to speak the will of God. The will of God is increase, increase of cattle, increase of offspring of the herds. And so the will of God is that our wealth increases, not decreases. Okay, what are we, what are you saying about employment? Uh, oh, I'm never going to find a job or... You know, I'm, I'm going to quickly find a new job and it's going to be amazing. So are you speaking positive or negative over employment? Okay, what are you saying about the economy, about poverty, about lack? And so there's some people saying, you know, I've, I've never had any money. My family's never had any money. We've always been poor. It's, nothing's ever going to change. Well, as long as you speak that way, you're, you're correct. It never will change because you're speaking words of faith of defeat over your finances and you will receive according to what you believe and what you speak out of your mouth. Okay, what about the area of success? Are you speaking success or failure over your projects, over activities that you're doing in life, over your capabilities? You know, are you saying, oh, I can't preach, I'm not a good speaker? Well, guess what? You're not going to be <laughs> until you change the way you speak. So you want to speak forth good capabilities. You want to declare that you can preach and teach with boldness and authority, 
that you can produce great faith in the people, you know, and so forth, that you are poised and confident speaking to the group of people. You know, so whatever capabilities you're thinking about, um, speak good things over them. Cause them to raise up rather than condemning them. So raise up your capabilities. Don't condemn your abilities. Are you declaring that, oh, I just don't have any faith. I'm weak in faith. I'm full of fear. Are you declaring that? Or are you saying that you are mighty in faith? You know, so you have to pick a positive direction in the things you're saying. Are you somebody who says, you know, God just never answers my prayers. I don't know what it is, but every time I pray for something, it just never seems to be answered. Well, you're declaring a continuation of that problem by speaking that way. We need to say what Jesus said, that all of our prayers would be answered. He said that many times that all of our prayers would be answered. So we need to have that declaration rather than declaring that our prayers are never answered. Okay, what are we saying about health? Are we saying that we're going to live a long, healthy life like Moses, 120 years old, with strength, with sound mind, with clear vision, with comfort and high activity level? Are we saying that? Or are we agreeing with what they tell you on the news? You know, hey, you know, I just got my nursing home insurance and I got my subscription to monthly depend deliveries. And, you know, what are you saying? Are you speaking defeat? You know, oh, I guess when I get to a certain age, I'm going to have to get reading glasses. What are, what are you saying? Are you speaking in agreement with withering? Or are you speaking in, gre- in agreement with the will of God, which is your youth renewed like the eagle? Amen? So we need to pick the right direction to, of what we're going to say about our health. Are we saying that we're never going to be healed? You know, I've been sick so long. I guess God's not going to answer that prayer. You know, if you have that mindset, even though I understand people are in frustrating situations, But if you keep speaking in agreement with failure, you will continue to receive failure. So the fact that we're frustrated about something and speaking in agreement with that frustration, that doesn't opt us out of this rule over here, which is the law of faith, that we're going to receive the words that we speak. So we have to, in the face of frustration, we have to speak victory. We can't agree with the frustration. We can't agree with that longstanding sickness or pain or whatever that we've been suffering. We can't speak in agreement of it with it. We can't speak it into the future. We have to begin speaking against it. We have to begin speaking health and comfort and strength. So we have to change the words that are coming out of our mouth. Amen. All right. So you get the idea. Protection. What are we saying about protection? Are we speaking? You know that we're. Are we declaring that no evil will befall us? Or are we saying, you know, I don't want to go out at night because the boogeyman might get me. I don't want to go out tonight because some rapist is on the prowl. You know, are we speaking words of fear about our safety? Or are we saying, you know what, I don't care if there is a murderer out there. He's not going to touch me for it is written that nothing shall by any means harm me. For it is written, no evil will befall me. For it is written, his angels are in charge of me to protect me in all of my ways. So what are you saying? Are you speaking forth that you're at risk, that you're fearful, that you're worried about some danger out there? Or are you speaking, you know, I'm not worried about what the world says. I can do what I want. I'm protected by God. You know, the world may want you to be afraid and put a mask on and get shots in the arm. But I don't care about any of that stuff because I'm protected by God. Um, No evil will befall me. No plague will come near my dwelling and so forth. So... Um, then what are you saying about yourself? Like there's certain phrases that people say that are really bad phrases if used in a negative direction. Like maybe somebody says, you know, I I, I never, like I, I always, you know, I always um, do such and such bad thing. I, I always trip up on my words when I'm trying to speak in front of people. I always, I always get anxiety when I stand in front of the people to preach and teach. You know, if somebody's speaking like that, I always do something negative. If that's their confession, that's going to continue into the future. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are prophesying a future of always having that bad thing into the future. Uh, I never, I, I never, I never, I never do well in school. I never do this. I never do that. You know, so if you're declaring defeat and speaking into the future, you're, you're going to receive it. Or maybe we're doing that over another person. So-and-so, this person, they're never going to overcome addiction. They're never going to change. 
They're never going to be loving. They're never, they're always going to be a pain. They're never going to be good to me. You know, you're speaking a negative future over a person. And so we need to make sure that we're not speaking future condemning words that persist into the future. All right, so this is our homework. So think about all these areas of life. And this is a partial list. I'm sure you can make a bigger list, but just be thinking, where am I speaking negative? Where am I speaking the will of God? Where am I speaking the will of the devil? Where am I agreeing with God? And where am I agreeing with the devil? And then let us just course correct and let's get some excellent speech. Excellent meaning we're always speaking in agreement with the will of God. We're always speaking life. We're always speaking blessing, always speaking victory. Amen. All right, so that's our homework, and we're going to wrap up there.